Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 15. A Telegram. November is the most disagreeable month in the whole year, said Margaret, standing at the window one dull afternoon looking out at the frostbitten garden. That's the reason I was born in it, observed Jo pensively, quite unconscious of the blood on her nose. If something very pleasant should happen now, we should think it a delightful month, said Beth, who took a hopeful view of everything, even November. I dare say, but nothing pleasant ever does happen in this family, said Meg, who was out of sorts. We go grubbing along day after day without a bit of change and very little fun. We might as well be in a treadmill. My patience, how blue we are! cried Joe. I don't much wonder, poor dear, for you see other girls having splendid times while you grind, 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 year in and year out. Oh, don't I wish I could manage things for you as I do for my heroines. You're pretty enough and good enough already, so I'd have some rich relation leave your fortune unexpectedly. Then you dash out as an heiress, scorn everyone who has slighted you, go abroad and come home, my lady something, in a blaze of splendor and elegance. People don't have fortunes left them in that style nowadays. Men have to work and women to marry for money. It's a dreadfully unjust world, said Meg bitterly. Joe and I are going to make fortunes for you all. Just wait ten years and see if we don't said Amy, who sat in a corner making mud pies, as Hannah called her little clay models of birds, fruit, and faces. Can't wait, and I'm afraid I haven't much faith in ink and dirt, though I'm grateful for your intentions. Meg sighed and turned to the frostbitten garden again. Joe groaned and leaned both elbows to the table in a despondent attitude, but Amy spat it away energetically. And Beth, who sat at the other window, said, smiling, Two pleasant things are going to happen right away. Marmy is coming down the street, and Laurie is tramping through the garden as if he had something nice to tell. And they both came, Mrs. March, with her usual question, Any letter from the father girls? And Laurie, to say in his persuasive way, but Won't some of you come for a drive? I've been working away at mathematics till my head is in a muddle, and I'm going to freshen my wits by a brisk turn. It's a dull day, but the air isn't bad, and I'm going to take Brooke home, so it will be gay inside if it isn't out. Come, Joe, you and Beth will go, won't you? Of course we will. Much obliged, but I'm busy. And Meg whisked out her work basket, for she had agreed with her mother that it was best, for her at least, not to drive often with the young gentleman. We three will be ready in a minute, cried Amy, running away to wash her hands. Can I do anything for you, Madam Mother? asked Clory, leaning over Mrs. March's chair with the affectionate look and tone he always gave her. No, thank you, except call at the office. If you'll be so kind, dear, it's our day for a letter, and the postman hasn't been. Father is as regular as the sun. There's some delay in the way, perhaps. A sharp ring interrupted her, and a minute after Hannah came in with a letter. It's one of them horrid telegraph things, Mom, she said, handing it as if she was afraid it would explode into sudden damage. At the war telegraph, Mrs. March snatched it, read the two lines it contained, and dropped back into her chair as white as if the little paper had sent a bullet to her heart. Laurie dashed downstairs for water while Meg and Hannah supported her, and Joe read aloud in a frightened voice. Mrs. March, your husband is very ill. Come at once. S. Hale. Blank Hospital, Washington. How still the room was as they listened breathlessly. How strangely the day darkened outside, and how suddenly the whole world seemed to change as the girls gathered about their mother, feeling as if all the happiness and support of their lives was about to be taken from them. Mrs. March was herself again directly, read the message over, and stretched out her arms to her daughters, saying in a tone they never forgot, I shall go at once, but it may be too late. Oh, children, children, help me bear it. For several minutes there was nothing but the sound of sobbing in the room, mingled with broken words of comfort, tender assurances of help, and hopeful whispers that died away in tears. 
Poor Hannah was the first to recover, and with unconscious wisdom she set all the rest a good example, for with her work was the panacea for most afflictions. The Lord, keep the dear man. I won't waste no time a-crying, but get your things ready right away, Mom, she said heartily as she wiped her face in her apron, gave her mistress a warm shake of the hand with her own hard one, and went away to work like three women in one. She's right. There's no time for tears. Be calm, girls, and let me think. They try to be calm, poor things, as their mother sat up, looking pale but steady, and put away her grief to think and plan for them. Where's Laurie? She asked presently when she had collected her thoughts and decided on the first duties to be done. Here, ma'am. Oh, let me do something, cried the boy, hurrying from the next room, whither he had withdrawn, feeling that their first sorrow was too sacred for even his friendly eyes to see. Send a telegram saying I'll come at once. The next train goes early in the morning. I'll take that. What else? The horses are ready. I can go anywhere, do anything he said, looking ready to fly to the ends of the earth. Leave a note at Aunt Marches. Joe, give me that pen and paper. Tearing off the blank side of one of her newly copied pages, Joe drew the table before her mother, well knowing that money for the long, sad journey must be borrowed, and feeling as if she would do anything to add a little to the sum for her father. Now go, dear, but don't kill yourself driving at a desperate pace. There's no need of that. Mrs. March's warning was evidently thrown away, for five minutes later Laurie tore by the window in his own fleet horse, riding as if for his life. Joe, run to the rooms and tell Mrs. King that I can't come. On the way, get these things. I'll put them down. They'll be needed, and I must go prepared for nursing. Hospital stores are not always good. Beth, go and ask Mr. Lawrence for a couple bottles of old wine. I'm not too proud to beg for father. He shall have the best of everything. Amy, tell Hannah to get down the, blank, the black truck, trunk, and Meg, come and help me find my things, for I'm half bewildered. Writing, thinking, and directing all at once might well bewilder the poor lady, and Meg begged her to sit quietly in her room for a little while and let them work. Everyone scattered like leaves before a gust of wind, and the quiet, happy household was broken up as suddenly as if the paper had been an evil spell. Mr. Lawrence came hurrying back with Beth, bringing every comfort the kind old gentleman could think of for the invalid, and friendliest promises of protection for the girls during the mother's absence, which comforted her very much. There was nothing he did an offer from his own dressing gown to himself as an escort, but that last was impossible. Mrs. March would not hear of the old gentleman's undertaking the long journey, yet an expression of relief was visible when he spoke of it for anxiety ill fits one for travelling. He saw the look, knit his heavy eyebrows, rubbed his hands, and marched abruptly away, saying he'd be back directly. No one had time to think of him again till, as Meg ran through the entry with a pair of rubbers in one hand and a cup of tea in the other, she came suddenly upon Mr. Brooke. "'I'm very sorry to hear this, Miss March,' he said in the kind, quiet tone, which sounded very pleasantly to her perturbed spirit. I came to offer myself as escort to your mother. Mr. Lawrence has commissions for me in Washington, and it will give me real satisfaction to be of service to her there. Down dropped the rubbers, and the tea was very near falling as Meg put out her hand, with a face so full of gratitude that Mr. Brooke would have felt repaid for a much greater sacrifice than the trifling one of time and comfort which he was about to make. How kind you all are! Mother will accept, I'm sure! And it will be such a relief to know that she has someone to take care of her. Thank you very, very much. Meg spoke earnestly and forgot herself entirely till something in the brown eyes looking down at her made her remember the cooling tea and lead the way into the parlor, saying she would call her mother. Everything was arranged by the time Laurie returned with a note from Aunt March, enclosing the desired sum and a few lines repeating what she had often said before that she had always told him it was absurd for March to go into the army. Always predicted that no good would come of it, and she hoped they would take her advice in the next time. Mrs. March put the note in a fire, the money in her purse, and went on with her preparations with her lips folded tightly, in a way which Joe would have understood if she had been there. The short afternoon wore away. All the other errands were done, 
and Meg and her mother busy at some necessary needlework while Beth and Amy got tea, and Hannah finished her ironing with what she called a slap and a bang, but still Joe did not come. They began to get anxious, and Laurie went off to find her, for no one ever knew what freak Joe might take into her head. He missed her, however, and she came walking in with a very queer expression of countenance, for there was a mixture of fun and fear, satisfaction and regret in it, which puzzled the family as much as did the roll of bills she laid before her mother, saying, with a little choke in her voice, That's my contribution toward making father comfortable and bringing him home. My dear, where did you get it? Twenty-five dollars! Joe, I hope you haven't done anything rash. No, it's mine, honestly. I didn't beg, borrow, or steal it. I earned it, and I don't think you'll blame me, for I only sold what was my own. 